Hi, and welcome to the Sonicware Live and Lo-Fi 12 tutorial. The Lo-Fi 12 is a Groovebox sampler with the ability to record audio directly from its line-in into 128 different sample slots. It has a four-track sequencer, meaning that we can record things like melodic parts and then percussive parts to different tracks. It has a filter and an envelope per track along with LFOs with different shapes. There's also an effects section per track and it comes with multiple playback modes, built-in MIDI and sync for connecting to external gear, and there's a pattern edit mode and then an overlay so that we can deep edit our samples. So what actually is a Groovebox sampler? Well, let's just take a quick look at what a sample actually is first. A sample is usually a short digital audio recording. So on the Lo-Fi 12, we can create a pitched note from something like a synthesizer and then use that to play back chord sequences. Or we can sample a kick drum, and then sequence that however we like. Or we could take something like a drum break, and then mangle that using effects and filters uh, to create something new. And then because this is a groove box and we've got multiple tracks, we can then combine all those things and do them all at once. The live ends are pattern based, so we can make a pattern like the one we've just seen. We can then chain that together with other patterns to play in order. So just using the tools within the Live and Lo-Fi 12, we can build up complete tracks. And that's what makes the groove box element of it so interesting. So let's just start by taking a quick look at the way this is laid out. We've got 16 knobs, uh, 15 of which have start and end points to them, but this value knob here is an encoder, so it's stopless. We've got 16 rubber buttons and then 16 uh, round plastic buttons below that, which are used for mostly for entering steps. And then we've got a keyboard below made up of 27 keys, making up just over two octaves. We've got a power socket at the top left for our power supply and a power switch. A display that's going to give us feedback as to what we're editing. We've got our sync in and out sockets so that we can link up to something like a Korg Volker, which gives us a sync via pulse. A MIDI in and out, which we can again link up to other equipment, keyboards and things like that. Line in and out, a line in is, which is used for recording uh, the samples directly into the Lo-Fi 12. A headphone socket and then a built-in speaker. And on the back there is a compartment for uh, six AA batteries. So the overall layout is that the knobs at the top make edits to our sounds. Uh, this section here with the rubber buttons has got a track selection and um, other things like transport control for playing and stopping and selecting parts of patterns. The steps below are used for entering steps into a sequence and then we can play notes on the keys. By the way, at the end of this video, you'll find an accessibility section. This is because the live ends have attracted some attention from uh, visually impaired users. So this section just goes through and lists each control in order by name. So to get started, all we need to do is plug in our power supply or uh, put batteries in the battery compartment in the back and then just hold down the button for a second. And it'll power up. And we can press play and we'll hear the default pattern that loads. And pressing play again we'll stop the sequence. As you can hear it's playing through the internal speaker, uh, but for the rest of this demonstration I'm just going to plug in a cable into the line out and then we can get a clean recording. So now we've got that hooked up when we press play. I've got a much cleaner version of the sound coming through my computer. But the speaker's still on, uh, so we can mute that. So one of the conventions of the live ends is that we have shift and function for accessing different features on the device. So if we hold down function, we can access all the different text written under the buttons. So function and this button here will mute the speaker. So now when we press play, we're not getting sound from here, we're just getting it through the line out. It mutes automatically when we plug headphones in, but it doesn't when we use the line out. Uh, also, we can access our volume for our headphones here. So the volume changes, but we can boost or reduce the gain of the headphones separately by using this control here. So gain, press that once, and then we get a selection on the screen between loud and normal and soft. I like mine on loud. And then we can press it again to go back to the pattern edit mode. 
Shift works in a similar way, apart from when we just turn a knob normally, we access the function that's written in uppercase letters below the knob. And then when we hold shift, we access the function that's written in lowercase letters below the knob. So in this case, I'm altering the bank setting and then holding shift, I'm altering the start position. I'll cover those in detail obviously later. But then if we want to lock the shift, we can hold function and press shift. And then that will lock us to editing the start position. This is useful if you want to play while you're editing your sounds. And then we just press uh, shift again to clear that lock. So what we've been listening to so far is one of the preset patterns that comes under the device. There are 16 preset patterns within bank one and then banks two to four will be empty on yours. Mine's got some stuff in already because I've been playing with it quite a lot. But if we want to pick another pattern, we just press the pattern button here and then these buttons become our pattern selection buttons. So we can press five and the fifth pattern will load and then we can hear that. So if we wanted a pattern from a different bank, we could press pattern and then the octave buttons here become our bank buttons. So bank two, two, three and four. So bank two will have something of mine in on pattern one you may recognize from an earlier video. Yeah, let's go back to pattern uh, pattern five in bank one like this. Alternatively, you can press the pattern button and then use the value knob to scroll through, um, right through all the patterns and all the banks. It's just another way of accessing them. So when we press play, we can use the uh, BPM knob here. You'll notice we've got a pattern BPM and a global BPM. They're two separate things. So a pattern BPM is saved within a pattern and if but if we want to override that and say chain a few different patterns together that have different bpms we can switch to global bpm so i'll demonstrate that in a second so as we play we can alter our bpm uh, you may notice if you do this on some patterns they they might sort of break down a little bit that's possibly because they contain loops loops won't respond to uh, changes in bpm this pattern happens to be built up from individual hits so that BPM will work properly. If you want to switch to that global BPM I mentioned earlier, we hold function and press the BPM button here. So that switches into global BPM mode. So that pattern BPM isn't working, so we need to go shift and then we access our global BPM. One thing you should notice as a pattern plays is that these buttons here will change color. These are our page selection buttons, and they also change as a pattern place to show where we are. This is quite a long pattern, so it's got four different pages. That's page one, that's page two. If we double tap this button, that changes to page three and page four, and then back to page one. So you'll see these change. As I mentioned before, we can chain patterns together. So if I let this play and then pick another pattern, it's gonna wait till it's got through all that before it loads the next one. So I'll do that now. So you can seamlessly load one pattern after the other. Obviously we're in global BPM mode, so the BPM is gonna remain consistent. If you're not and you're in pattern BPM, the BPM will change to the pattern BPM. Another thing we can do with the pattern button is we can press it twice and that put us, puts us into pattern chain mode. We can then pick a whole bunch of different patterns, press play, and those will play in sequence. One thing I need to mention early on is the knob latch mode. This is to prevent you from accidentally overwriting things that you've saved into a pattern by maybe nudging a knob by accident. So the way we turn that on and off is holding the function and pressing this here, it says latch. So when this is not lit, knob latch is off, and when it's lit, it's on. So I'll just demonstrate it with it on. As you can see, this pattern BPM turned all the way down at the moment. So we load that outrun uh, pattern back in again, press play. And you'll notice as I try and move this, it appears to do nothing. That's because we need to pass it through 85 BPM for it to latch back on. And then we're able to change it. It depends if you prefer this on or off, but um, for the purposes of the rest of this demonstration, I'm just gonna turn it off just to make my tweaking a little less frustrating. 
So now let's take a look at tracks and patterns. So a pattern contains four different tracks and then also some global information that's saved alongside that, like the global reverb and things like the BPM uh, setting that we mentioned earlier. But the four different tracks are selected here and each one of those contains its own settings, which are the bits in the gray area and then its own settings from this gray area also. So I've loaded this funk pattern and I'm gonna play it and all four tracks will play. And the one we're gonna be editing is selected by using these track buttons. So as you can see, as I press different track buttons, these lights here change because this is step information. So there's different rhythms and things programmed into each of these tracks. So we can mute the other tracks by holding function and pressing the track buttons. So that will mute them. Okay, so track one contains the drums. If we add in this one, we've got a bass. And this one contains like a electric piano sort of sound. And the last track contains melodic information. So each track can have its own sample, but also things like LFOs and filters and envelopes and everything that shapes those sounds can be different per track. Also on the Lo-Fi 12, uh, we've got an effect section per track. So there's an awful lot of power here. There's a really useful diagram within the Lo-Fi 12 manual that shows how this is all set out, uh, which I'll show now. Another thing we can do with tracks is we can clear information from them. So if we hold this clear button and press a track, we'll be asked if we want to clear the notes or the sound. Clearing a sound will return it to whatever state it was in when we saved the pattern. Whereas clearing notes will remove all this note information. So now this, this track has no notes recorded into it, but the sound is still there. So let's try making something from scratch. Uh, I could clear this pattern if I wanted to with clear and pattern, and that will erase all these uh, notes and sounds. The name is still there, but the, the pattern is completely blank. Or what I prefer to do actually is to load up a new uh, empty pattern. So I'm gonna go pattern of uh, bank three for me is empty. Bank two will probably be empty for you. The first pattern in bank three will be empty. So let's load up a sound. We've got our bank and sample knobs here. There are eight different banks with 16 samples in each. So in bank one, there are drum samples and bass samples. So it starts off with a kick drum. And then as we scroll through the sample knob, we've got different kicks and snares. So, and a few basses at the end. So the 16 in each one. So next up, we've got instruments. lots of different sounds that we can play um, things like chords on and then we've got a loop bank which, which contain longer samples that we can uh, create long notes in the sequence for and get them to loop and then we've got a couple of banks of various different samples most of which used in the patterns that come on the device and then after that your banks will be blank I've got a couple of different banks here I've loaded up already so let's go back to bank one and just pick that kick drum and you'll notice, even though it's a drum sound, it will still respond to the keys. What's happening here is it's playing the sample faster and it, so it gets shorter. That's more obvious on the loops actually. So it's playing the loop faster. So the, the time it takes to play will be shorter. If you drop down to one of the instruments, let's just choose that electric piano sound. We can play chords. We can save our chords into a sequence. So this, this machine is completely polyphonic, up to 10 voices shared across the four tracks. So um, yeah, we can play, play notes on the keys and we can use these octave buttons here to access. Higher and lower octaves. So we can just poke notes directly into the sequence if we want to. So using the a combination of the step buttons and the keys. We can program notes directly in. If you want some of those notes to be a little bit quieter, we've got this velocity here. So velocity is a per note volume. So we can turn this down. So if we wanted a, a little, say another C, but really quiet in between these two or after it. 
we can turn down the velocity before we program in the note and then that will be made quieter. The default setting for the velocity knob is 100, so we can go a little bit louder too if we want to. Removing notes from a sequence is really easy too. Again, it's just a clear button to hold clear and press notes and we can take them away. One thing I need to mention quickly is the release and gate time and also the attack, which is on the same knob. Um, by default, when we play a key, we're at release 100, which adds a little bit of a tail onto the end as, as we let a key off. If we turn this down, that becomes shorter and shorter. At 63, we've got a zero release, and below that, uh, we're affecting what's called the gate time of each of these notes. So if we programmed in uh, a note at the moment, that would fill up one step uh, and no more. But if we turn it down, we're going to get shorter and shorter uh, gate times within each step. So just to demonstrate that quickly, I'll just program in a few notes uh, really close together on different steps. So, so that's with our release set at 63, so those steps are going to be completely full. And as we turn it down, you'll hear that they get shorter and shorter. Until you get just these little short clicks. I'm just going to put it back to 63 and get rid of all that. Um, and also we've got attack on this knob. So if we do our shift lock thing we showed earlier and turn up the attack, we can create sounds that have a longer uh, time to get going. But I'm just gonna leave that at zero for now because there's something I want to show you with the step record mode. So step record mode works with our auto step feature, which is here. If auto step is on, when we use a step record mode, it's going to automatically advance uh, as, as the steps go along, which we'll see in a second. So if we turn on record, that puts it into step record mode. We can select a step, we can program something in here, then it's going to automatically shift on because auto steps on. If we did that here, that would move to step eight and so on. So we've got those chords programmed in. Also within the step record mode, we can use what are called tied notes. Uh, so if we hold function, we've got a tie feature here that's switched on. So if we hit record, pick a step, play some notes, and then press another step button. That's gonna make a nice long tied uh, sequence here. So those two notes we've programmed in for that chord are gonna be hold on for all four of these steps. It's something that needs to be turned on too if you're going to um, real-time record chords in that are going to be held because if you don't, they'll be chopped off short. Talking of real-time mode, now's a good time to demonstrate that too. So let's just clear all those notes again. And I'm going to turn on the metronome. So there's a metronome down here. So we you press function and this key. And that we can using that, we can dial in the volume. Uh, so when we press play, we've got a click at the tempo that we can play along to. And there's also a pre-count function. So this will count as in before it starts recording. Uh, so if record is on, that's going to give us four beats before we start recording. So I'm going to hit record and just play something in in real time. There we go, we've got a little sequence we've played in and we can turn the metronome off again by going back in here and just turning the volumes of the metronome with the pre count down. Remember the live ends have a step sequence of those, so you may find that your recordings sound a little bit different when they're played back just because the start and end times to your playing will be quantized to each step. Now we've got some notes recorded in, I can use the transpose function here if I want to. So if I want to shift that up and down in semitones, I can just come in here and press transpose and change that here. And it won't change until the end of the length of the pattern. So, no, it's not an instant change, it only changes when it wraps back around. So, I've just cleared that track out again. I'm going to go back down to our drums. I'm going to pick that kick drum and set the release back to 63. And I'm just going to program in a quick kick drum pattern and just vary the rhythm a little bit as we go through, something like that. So that's just uh, 16 steps. If I wanted to make that longer, I can use the length function here. So hit length. And that's gonna make this track a bit longer. So we could dial up to 32. Then we've got the two pages that we talked about earlier. So I can go to page two and program something slightly different than this one. Let's go, I don't know. Let's 
like that. So now we've got a 32 step pattern. So if we turn the metronome back on again, we can hear that that is running uh, at 16th compared to the tempo. But if we want to change that, maybe make it run faster, we can change it to 30 seconds. Or we can make it slower, so comparative to the tempo. So by using that note function, which is per track, we can have some tracks that are really condensed with 30 second notes really close together, lots of detail, and then have ones that are stretched out really long that evolve over a really, really, really long time with notes that are spaced really far apart. So it's really good for making the most of your patterns. I'm just gonna put that back uh, to 16ths, which is there. So if we wanted to now, we could change the level of this track and pan it around. We can do that by holding shift and turning these two knobs here. So this one will pan from left to right and this one will change our level, so. One really useful feature when it comes to things like drums is the laid back setting. What this does is, is it delays the start of the steps away from the metronome. So if I just turn on the metronome and then play that kick and then turn up the laid back knob, you'll hear the kick slowly move away from that metronome. So we've got access to some much less rigid timings if you want to move things away from the grid a little bit. We can use it on a snare track, for example, to push the snare away from the metronome and just give it that kind of human feel. This can be automated per step too, as can all the controls, but I'll cover that a bit later on when it comes to parameter locks. So now I'll just save that down by holding function and pressing the pattern button. So there's a save function here. And this works the same way as we load a pattern in and we can choose a bank and a pattern. I'm just gonna save it to exactly the same place that we started. So now uh, that's saved that work. So one of the nicest things I think about the Lo-Fi 12 is its quick sampling option, which we can access directly from the pattern edit mode without having to use the overlay. And also its ability to sample uh, instruments directly in through audio. Um, so I've got this monosynth plugged in here. Um, anything with a line out or a headphone socket will work. You'll just need to make sure your cables match up and then this end is a 3.5 mil plug. So if I press a key on here now, we can hear the synth. Uh, if you can't, you, you probably need to check the line in settings, which are here, so function and line in. The first one you'll see is gain, and we can turn the volume uh, up and down here uh, of the line in. And then the next one along in the, in the menu is we can switch monitoring this input from mono to stereo. This is a mono source though, so we don't need to mess with that for here. So for the quick sampling option, there's some settings we can access from here function and settings, the first one of which is an auto level. This is the threshold at which it automatically starts recording and receives it, uh, audio. Minus 60 is the most sensitive and then we can turn it all the way up if we want to manually trigger that to off. I'm gonna leave it at minus 60, it's nice and snappy and sensitive. And the next one along is the sampling frequency. This sets the quality at which we're going to make our recordings. 12 kilohertz is a low quality recording, which gives us four seconds per slot. And then if we turn it around to 24, that's two seconds of recording at a higher quality, which is what I'm gonna use for the synth, because it's quite bright. We need that upper frequency information to make it make sense. So the way that quick sampling works is we use our bank and sample knobs to find a sample that we want to overwrite. So I've got quite a lot of stuff in here already. So I need to go to bank eight, sound number nine before I reach something that's empty. So we, we can play a key and we're hearing nothing, so we know we're not overwriting anything. Then we go to function sampling here. And at this point, you may notice a little bit of a drop in volume, so I just need to turn this up a bit. Our LEDs in the front here are gonna show us the volume of the incoming audio signal. And then all we need to do is press record again, and it's it says record, and it's waiting for the audio. And then, that sample is then recorded in. It's as quick as that. So we just press OK and it's asking us if we want to save and then we press OK again and that's saved that into that sample. So our pattern that we had before, track one was the kick. So I'm gonna to go to track two, I'm gonna turn all the way up into bank eight, load that sound, which is number nine. And there is the exact thing we just recorded. So while we're talking about the line in socket, 
we can use the livens as an effects unit. So on all Liven models, uh, we have the ability to send the line in through to one of the effects units on the system. This On this particular model, it's the reverb. So a reverb is an algorithm designed to simulate the sound of a large space. So if we press a key here, you better hear there's a little bit of it there already. If we turn this knob up, we've got a lot more of that sound of that big space. We can also control how much of the line in is sent through to the reverb algorithm from this line in to reverb setting here. So shift and this, if we want no, none of the line in to be sent through to it, we can just turn it off and then varying amounts. So if we want loads, just crank this up. And then we've also got lots of different types of reverb from here. So shift and reverb accesses the reverb type. So hall, room, arena, plate, tunnel, and they all have different characteristics. The infinity one's particularly big. And then there's also a couple of different settings that we can use for simulating tape and vinyl. This is a global effect, so it's on the end of everything. Um, but we can also choose to send differing amounts of tracks to it from the this reverb setting, which I'll show a bit later on. I've put that synth away now, but I've just noticed because that synth was analog, it drifted slightly before I got a chance to record the note coming out of it, so it's slightly out of tune. But we can sort that out easily. We've got a pitch function here under one of the steps. So if we hold function and press this, keep tapping it, it will go up in increments of 100, which are equal to one semitone. That's um, from one note to an adjacent note. So, so E to F or F to F sharp is uh, one semitone. So shift and pitch it starts at zero and then 100 is one semitone higher. And so on, and we can go all the way through to minus six semitones and loop back around to zero. But I want to make a fine adjustment uh, our tuner is telling me that we're about 20 cents too sharp. So while this is on the display, we can use the value knob to turn this down just a little bit. So minus 20. And then we're nicely in tune. There are a few other things we can do that are related to pitch. Now we've got that sample loaded in, we can route what's called an LFO to pitch. An LFO is like a slowly moving shape that we can use for things like vibrato. So if I turn the rate of the LFO up here, and then add a little bit of uh, LFO to pitch. We're gonna get that vibrato, but we don't have to stick to that sine wave shape. There are other LFO shapes. Function and shape here will change. We've got sine, square, and then um, triangle, saws, and random shapes. Logarithmic curves, different pulse lengths, and then some stepped shapes. So as loads you can do with that. Let's just put it back onto triangle. Something that's a bit like vibrato, because there's another function we've got here. We've got an LFO delay. So if you tap this and turn that time up, we're going to get a, a section at the start of the note after we've played it that will not have LFO on it, and then it will kick in. So that's good for things like uh, leads, where you want to, the LFO t to kick in and do a little vibrato after a, a short length of time. We also have a pitch sweep function on the uh, livens. So to turn this on and off, we hold the function button and we use the octave buttons here. So we can add a s upward sweep. And then the speed and range of the sweep can be altered with these knobs. So shift and speed. The higher this number, the longer it takes. And then with shift in this knob, we can change the range in semitones all the way up to one and two octaves. If you want a downward sweep, we hold function and press this. Then if we want to turn the sweep off again, we just hold function and press whichever of the sweep buttons is lit and then it'll go off. We've also got a sweep curve here. So with that sweep, we get to choose uh, how that kicks in. So linear, Exponential, logarithmic, they're all going to sound slightly different to each other. What's useful though is that these pitch sweeps are recorded per note into a sequence. So we can have a sequence that's a mixture of pitch sweeps and non pitch sweep notes in it. So if I turn the pitch sweep on and record something into one of the steps, that's going to remember that. And then I can turn the pitch sweep off again, and the rest of the sequence could have notes 
that don't have pitch sweep on them. So far we've been playing all our notes polyphonically, that is we can play chords, but there are also other voice modes on the livens. So if I hold function and press the mode here, we can go from polyphony, which is what we're on now, to mono. Alongside this is also a glide amount. So if I hold function and press the adjustment while in mono mode, we can dial in a, an amount of glide between these notes. Which creates little pitch sweeps between them too. There's also a legato mode, which is similar to, to mono, but it won't restart the envelope every time a new note is played. So if I go to adjust again, this has got its own glide amount, so I need to dial that in separately. You can hear that the note will eventually die away because it's not being re-triggered. We then have an arpeggio as one of our voice modes, which will also respond to the yeah, release and gate. If we want to change the speed of that relative to the tempo, we can change the note value for the track and that will speed up or slow down the arpeggiator. Again, alongside the arpeggiator, there are different uh, different modes that we can access from the adjust parameter. So this is up. If we tap it again, we can get to down and then up, down and lots of different uh, patterns. So a random one and then we get into up plus an octave and so on. And so there's lots of different, That's this one's play order and then back to up. So a really flexible arpeggiator. So I've set our mode back to legato and I've just changed this track length uh, to 32 to match the kick drum. So I'm just going to record a little melody over the top of our kick. So now we can have a look at the effects. So as mentioned before, we've got a global reverb. So if I turn that up a bit, I'm going to change the type maybe to infinity because it's nice and bright and obvious. And then we can turn up the reverb amount here for this track alone. So just more of this track has been sent to the reverb and not the kick. We also have a discrete effect section per track. So I can add some delay or one of the other effects types to this track and it also won't affect the kick. So there's lots of different things, chorus and flange, here's delay. So for every effect we've got two knobs, one controls the amount and one controls the speed. Generally speaking that's just it's sort of parameter one and parameter two, it depends which effect we've chosen. So I'm going to save that down and then we've saved our work. So we can also use the quick sample function to sample in the drum break, which is what I've got loaded up here on my phone. I'm going to do the same as before. I'm going to select a bank and sound that are empty, which would be this sound, sound 10 and bank 8 for me. And then I'm going to go to settings. I'm going to change that sampling frequency to the lower setting so that we get a good four seconds because that's enough to store this drum break. I'm going to go sampling. I'm going to press record and then press play. may notice it's a bit quiet. It's normalized automatically after recording, but that doesn't necessarily mean loud. Um, waveforms and things are going to sound loud, but drum breaks and things aren't necessarily going to sound loud because they're quite transient, but we'll sort that out in a minute. So I'm going to save that into this slot. So to get that volume level up, we could turn up the level of the track or we could turn up the whole pattern level and then everything else down. But what I'm going to do is use one of the effects. So in the effects section here, amongst all the other options, uh, distortion is a good one to get the volume up, but I'm going to use the compressor instead, which is a couple of slots along. So we've got a ratio and threshold on these two knobs. So it's actually quite an aggressive compressor. We can really smash stuff with this if we want to. But I think it's setting around here. 
sound nice for us. Now, this tempo won't match our uh, the tempo that we've got our pattern saved as. So just to show how we're going to sort this out, I'm going to create a long note from step 1 to 16. So if we do that, we're playing this C on the keyboard with neither of the octave buttons lit. That's going to produce the exact same sound that we recorded it in as. If you play up and down the keyboard, we're going to play back at different pitches and therefore different tempos. So I'm just going to mute those of the two tracks a minute just so we can hear what's going on. So our tempo is too fast, so we need to turn this down a bit. By the way, if you're, if you're tuning the tempo, uh, you can do it in large amounts with this knob, and then when it's on the screen, we can tweak it with small amounts with the value knob. But I think it's around 90 BPM, so I'm just going to dial that in. So that loops perfectly. So I can now unmute those other two tracks, and it should line up nicely with them. So anytime your loop's not lining up with your tempo, you just need to tweak your tempo a little bit or program it at a different note on the keyboard and you'll be able to find somewhere that lines up nicely. So just to make that drum beat super extra dirty, I'm just gonna mute these other two for a second and then I'm gonna turn on the 12-bit mode. So the 12-bit mode affects the dynamics of a sample as it plays, so it's gonna give it extra grit. So I'll, I'll select track three and it's just an on-off switch here per track. Um, I'm going to do this while it's playing so you can hear the difference. It's fairly subtle, but it has most impact on drum sounds. Just gives it that extra little shove. So with a drum break loaded in like this, it's a perfect time to show the sample start position setting, which is below the bank knob. Uh, so by default, it'll play from the start. But if we go into shift lock and start turning up this sample start time, we can decide where it starts within the sample. When it comes to samples that have been recorded in quick uh, record mode and also ones that don't have loop turned on in the deep sample edit, this will just scan through the entire sample. But if we picked an instrument, like on track four here, I've got this uh, saxophone. It works slightly differently. This has got a loop built into it, so it just loops constantly. Whenever we've got a sample with a loop loaded in, the sample start time will be shorter. As in the full range of the knob will only cut so far into the sample. This is just designed to cut the transients off the start of a sample. So in this case, So the idea is on looped instruments to cut the transient off, you've got a much finer uh, position setting across the range of the knob. So let's add some chords to track four and have a bit of a play around with a filter. So one of the available sounds in the various one bank is this synth lead sound. It's nice and bright. I'm just gonna pitch that down an octave. So if we want to, we can add a filter to this. We can press function and press filter. It's off by default. The first is a low pass filter and the second part of the display tells us the shape of the envelope that we can apply using this envelope depth and time uh, control. So if we uh, just play a note and move the cutoff, that's gonna move uh, the point at which the filter kicks in. Which part of the frequency spectrum it's cutting off. We can add a bit of resonance in or take it away. This adds a peak uh, at the point which the, the frequencies are cut off. So if we add a bit more resonance, it's a lot more obvious uh, where that cut off is. I'm just gonna turn that down a bit. So here's somewhere. And then with our depth and time, we can manipulate where this cut off is over time. So if I lengthen this all the way up to 100, that's gonna take a long time to go through that rise and fall. And then the depth sets how much of that uh, envelope affects the cutoff. So if we turn the time down, this works on a one filter per track basis, by the way, so it's paraphonic. So we've got uh, multiple voices of polyphony playing on the samples, but only one filter. So you can hear every time. 
I trigger a new note, uh, the filter is getting re-triggered despite the fact I'm holding other notes down. Within the filters there's also a low pass with just a fall and then with just a rise and an instant fall and then we've got other filter types too with the same envelope shape so high pass is going to cut away the bass and leave just the high frequencies and then we have a band pass which cuts away low and high frequencies and just leaves a section in the middle. But let's go back to that uh, low pass filter we had at the beginning cycle through because we can also route the LFO uh, that we've got here to the filter so whatever speed this is set at so using the same LFO that I demonstrated earlier to pitch we've got all those different shapes and we can route that to filter so it's going to move that cutoff around it's going to turn that back down I'm just, I'm just going to program a few chords into our sequence so I've programmed some chords in, I've turned on a little bit of LFO to pitch and added a bit of reverb, and now we've got this sequence. We can also add filters in the effects section if we want. So like I said, this has got an effects section per track. Then we've also got low and high pass filters available in there. So if I want to chop a little bit of that bottom end off just to kind of mix it, I could either go with low pass and high pass filter and we've got isolation and tilt uh, uh, EQs as well, all designed to sort of shape the, the sound as it hits the end of the track. So I'm just going to add a high pass filter on here and then just to sort of shake that bottom end a little bit. So that just helps us to mix things together. So let's talk about parameter locks. So parameter locking is just another name for automation. So we can automate the position of knobs as the pattern plays through, so we can record them in, or we can program them in exactly per step. We can automate anything within this gray area, including anything written in upper and lower case letters. So uh, cutoff and resonance can be automated. In fact, if you wanted to, you could just do all of these at once if you wanted it to program all that in or record all that in. I'm not sure it'd sound very good, but that's an option if you want to. So firstly, I'm just going to mute tracks four, two, and one, and just leave the drums. On track three, I'm going to turn on a filter here too. So that's what a filter on, those, on this drum break is going to sound like. We've got uh, parameter locks here. I'm going to turn on parameter recording by holding function and pressing the parameter lock button, and it'll turn red. So now as we play the sequence and I move this cut off, we can record that position per step. that's going to play that back as I recorded it in. You can see I've switched back to the green parameter lock. This is the playback mode. Um, if we don't want those parameter locks to play at all, we can press it until it turns off. And then they aren't played back. So green just means parameter locks are switched on. If we want to clear those parameter locks, we can just press clear and parameter lock and that'll be gone. If I wanted to program that cutoff position exactly per step, I can do that too. So just make sure parameter lock's on, hold a step, and turn uh, turn the knob. So let's just dial in a few things here. So as you can see on those steps here, I programmed in that cutoff is moving around. So related to the parameter lock function is the sound locking function. We can access this from the parameter lock button by pressing it until it turns orange. This automatically creates automation on newly programmed steps. So in this kick drum pattern, for example, I can replace uh, step nine with another uh, drum sound, like a snare. But this works best if it was switched on from the start. So I'm gonna have to just clear these uh, kick drums and just program them back in again. Just gonna get rid of them. And then I'm gonna pick our kick and put that rhythm back in again. Which is going to sound exactly the same, but what that's done is it's created automation on all these steps, telling it to move the knobs back to the kick drum. And then I'm going to pick a snare, and I'm going to change this one to a snare. So I'm just going to clear that, 
snare in here. So that's automatically programmed the sample and bank selections for that uh, step. So using that, we can program more than one drum sound into a track. So I can also add in something like a hi-hat for what it's to onto the remaining steps. So again, that's a great way of maximizing the capability of the tracks. So now we've got a nice full rhythm programmed into this track. It's a good uh, time to talk about swing. So adding swing will push back every even numbered step in time. So it gives a bit of a shuffle so we can demonstrate that. So that's good for getting a bit of groove into our rhythm. We can push back individual steps too with a laid back knob like we talked about earlier. So because we've got parameter locks on, we can uh, individually dial in a bit of delay onto each of these steps. So let's just push this hi-hat back a bit with laid back. So you can really get into sort of the micro timing of things that way. Another nice feature is the dice setting. This sets the probability that the steps we've programmed in will trigger. So by default is 100%. It's located here under the rate knob. So 100% obviously they'll always trigger. As we turn this down, as the sequence plays, we'll hear that they're less and less likely to, to play. All the way down to a 25% chance that they're gonna be triggered. We can use this again with the parameter locks. Uh, so we can program, say, these two steps to always trigger 100% and then adjust the rest of them. And that way you don't lose uh, your rhythm completely. We have some performance modes too on the LiFi 12, including random, which will randomly play different parts of the sequence. This works alongside the random step setting here, which is per track. So we need to turn this on in order for this to work. We can dial up, say, four steps, and then randomly chosen four step sections of this will play, as we'll see. So if I turn this on, so random is now on. It's picking one of these selections of four steps and randomly playing them in different orders. So we can turn that off. And then we've also got a stutter, which uh, is a performance mode where we can play different steps and it will repeat that until we let go. So if I turn that on. Which can be used as you play back a sequence. Maybe it sounds a little bit nice with something else added in. So I've just twisted the drum brake back on. So it's designed to be used like that as a as live performance feature. So there's just a few other things I'm going to skim over quickly before we head on to, over to the sample editing overlay. There's a few uh, menus down the bottom here we haven't talked about yet. So function and copy and paste here can copy whole tracks. Not only can these tracks be copied in a pattern, they can be copied from one pattern to another. Also, if we're in record mode, we can copy whole steps from one place to another, including all the parameter lock information. We've got a clock uh, menu here, which enables, enables us to choose the clock source between internal, MIDI, over sync, and from the line in, which is compatible with pocket operator that have audio and clock on the same socket. We can also choose whether we want the click to come out of the audio out for the same reason. We can route that into a pocket operator. Um, and then we have polarity rise and fall for the two sync outputs just for compatibility's sake. Um, we have um, MIDI channel settings here. so. For each of the tracks, we can set different uh, MIDI channels. And there's a few other things here that I'm not going to go over in detail because it will take me forever to explain them, but it's all written in the manual. Um, we have another MIDI menu here. We can turn on MIDI CCs on and off. So that's the control messages that are sent when we turn our knobs. So we can turn our MIDI uh, clock on and off from here. We can change the MIDI out to a soft MIDI through if we want to. And there's a few other things, again, which are a bit too in-depth for me to talk about here. So just check the manual for that. There's a data menu. In here, we can name our pattern. So if I press um, 
okay at this point. I can scroll through the characters using the, the value knob and then use the bank uh, buttons to select different parts of it. So we can turn these little dots on and off if we want to, change all the letters and then uh, we can, so we can save our, our custom name for our pattern. We can export a pattern by a MIDI sysx. So if we rig this up to a computer via a MIDI interface and use a piece of software like MIDIOX or a sysx librarian on Mac, we can save that data. And then if we want to recall this pattern back into the machine, we can transmit the data back in again. There's a system menu here that has an overall tuning that we can tweak, a battery selection. So by default, this will be alkali, but I've set mine to nickel metal because that's the rechargeables I have. So it's important that you set this if you're using rechargeables because your liver might think that your batteries are running out before they actually are because different rechargeables have different voltages. There's also a lithium uh, selection and uh, auto power off. So this will probably be set to half an hour. Um, you can dial it all the way up to six hours. I like the I like mine set to off so it doesn't turn itself off at all. Um, and then we've, we've already talked about the rest of these. So next thing is the overlay. So the sample editing overlay gives us a lot more functions on the quick sampling function we've been using so far. To use this, we need to hold function and press this key here with the sample underneath it. And then we need immediately need to add our overlay. These two buttons on the end change to indicators. They don't do anything when you press them. So um, this one's telling us we're in select mode. So these buttons uh, are now using these functions that are written underneath them. So these become our bank select uh, buttons for choosing different sample banks. When they're green, they're banks one to uh, four. Double tapping one of them will take us into uh, an orange mode where they are banks five to eight. So if we choose bank eight, which is where I've been recording lots of stuff, we can choose samples using the, uh, the buttons along the bottom, or we can scroll through using the value knob like we did before. So here's that sound we recorded earlier. We can use the keys and the octave buttons to check what our sounds sound like. If you want to, we can exit back to the pattern edit mode here by pressing the clear button, or we can select this sample to edit. Uh, there's a few more things here. I'll come back to them later. So I'm, I'm going to go through sound 11, I think is empty. So I'm going to choose that and press OK. And now the edit indicator is lit. So now we're using the functions that are written above these buttons. So I've got that little monosynth set up next to me. I'm going to record a new sound from that. So we can go into record mode by pressing record. And then we can choose whether they want to be in 24 kilohertz or 12 kilohertz mode. So that's what this uh, button does here. So when it's lit, we're in 24 kilohertz, which is two seconds of recording. And when it's unlit, we're in 12 kilohertz mode, which is four seconds. I'm going to leave that on. And I'm going to play a key. And we can see that uh, we've got a level here. We can adjust the incoming uh, volume of the line level from here. Should we need to? And then we can set the auto record threshold that we mentioned earlier here. So that's going to trigger uh, when it receives the least amount of signal. And then we can just turn it to off if we want to just punch record and go. So I'm going to hit record. And then we've got that sound. And then we have to play it back from here. So now we've got that sound loaded in, we can edit it. So we can use the uh, start and end knobs here. So as we turn these, these will move these values in the settings of 100. And then when that value is on the screen, we can fine adjust it with the value knob here. So we can cut the start off. And then cut the end off. All the way down to a really short sample. We can change the pitch. Again, in 100 equals one semitone. We can find uh, tune these pitches. We've got a level here. So we can save the overall level. So at the moment, if we play, you'll notice that a note will eventually stop. If we want that not to be the case, we can set a loop within that sustain section on the end. So we turn on looping here, which at the moment is just going to loop the whole sample, but we can close this, the looping endpoints in. And then we can fine tweak that, see if we can find something a bit smoother. So there we go, we've got a, a sound now that will loop no matter how long we hold it. 
Let's just switch that loop off for a second though, because I want to demonstrate the reverse function. So that's it playing forwards. And if we turn this on, the sample's going to play backwards. There's a few other things that aren't saved. So we've got the attack and release settings here, just like the ones on the front panel. But these aren't actually saved in the sample. These are just so you can demo how the sounds are going to sound with a soft attack and long release. And the same thing for velocity. It's just so we can test how things will sound at different volumes when they're played. So if we want to rename that sample, we'll just hit rename here, and that's going to give us that same selection as before. So I'm just going to dial in the name acid, why not? And then press OK, and that's done. One other thing we can do is we can set a fade using the step keys. So um, this ends abruptly because looping is turned off. But by using the step keys, we can set a fade anywhere from the beginning to right near the end. So if we tap step one, it's going to fade right from the start. Or if we want a shorter fade, like that. This is a good way of cleaning up samples that are just a little bit too long for the slot they're recorded into. This fade function will only work when the looping is turned off, though. So now if we want to save that sample, we press OK. That's going to ask us if we want to save it. And we press OK again. So any point before that, if we'd press clear, we would have not saved that sound. So now we're back on the selection menu, and that's our sound that we just made. So let's pick an, a fresh uh, sample slot again. So 12 is empty. We can press OK. If we want to copy that acid sound into this slot, we just press copy in, this little button here, and then select the sound again. So acid, press OK. And now we've copied that acid sound into, into slot 12, including the name. If we wanted to export that via MIDI SysX, we can hit the export button here. That will transmit this information over MIDI uh, so that we can save it onto our computer. And then if we want to transfer this sample back in again, we just send that MIDI back in while we're in edit mode and it will overwrite the current sample. We can also initialize our sound here. So if we press initialize, that's going to completely wipe that sound. So this will be empty. So I'm just going to back out to sample select again. And then we can see uh, we're in select mode. So we've got a rename function here too. This is for renaming the bank. We've got an export function that will export the whole 16 sounds within this one bank via MIDI SysX again in a large file. And then we can import them back in again using this function here. So this is for exporting. Once we hit OK, it's going to send MIDI out onto our computer that we can record. And then if we want to import that back in again, we hit import here and, and then it will wait to receive MIDI coming back in. So those are ways we can back up our sounds. I'll cover this in more detail in the video in the future, I think, because it's something that's important to know about. So from the sample select level, we can hit clear, and that takes us back into the pattern editing level. So that just about covers everything, I think. This has been a pretty epic one. Um, let me know in the comments if I've missed anything. If there's anything you want to know in more detail, I can always do another video in the future. Uh, so thanks very much for watching, and I hope you like and subscribe to this video. The only thing left to do is the uh, accessibility appendix section, which was be tacked on to this video. So thanks very much for watching. Cheers. So there's a power socket on the far left hand side. And then from left to right, the rest of the sockets are sync in, sync out, MIDI in, MIDI out, line in, line out, and then the headphone output. There's two rows of knobs. So knobs one to four across the top and then a value encoder and then knobs 1 to 11 across the bottom row. So I'll do the top row first. 1 is bank, 2 is sample, 3 is the FX speed, 4 is the FX amount. The shifted versions of these are 1 is start, 2 is laid back, 3 is swing, 4 is the reverb send per track. On the next row down, 1 is cutoff, 2 is the filter envelope depth, 3 is the filter envelope time, 4 is the rate for the LFO, 5 is the, the amount of LFO sent to pitch, 6 is the amount of LFO sent to cutoff, 7 is the release and gate, 8 is the overall reverb level, 9 is velocity, 10 is the pattern BPM, and 11 is volume. So the shifted versions of these are, 1 is the resonance for the filter, 2 is pan, 3 is the level for the track, 4 is the dice mode, 5 is the speed for sweep, 6 is the range of sweep, 7 is the attack, 8 is the line into reverb, 9 is the overall pattern level, 10 is the global BPM, and 11 is still volume. Moving on to the rubber buttons, 
button 1 is shift for the knobs, 2 is function for the rest of the buttons, 3, 4, 5 and 6 selects tracks 1 to 4 respectively, 7 is parameter lock, 8 is octave and bank down, 9 is octave and bank up, 10 is clear, 11 is ok, 12 is play, 13 is record, 14 is pattern, 15 is page buttons 1 and 3, and 16 is page buttons 2 and 4. The shifted versions are 3, 4, 5 and 6 mute tracks 1 to 4 respectively, 7 is parameter record, 8 is sweep down, 9 is sweep up, 10, 11 and 12 are still clear, ok and play, 13 is quick sample, 14 is save, 15 is tie and 16 is knob latch. For the step buttons, 1 switches the 12 bit mode on and off, 2 selects the filter and envelope type, 3 selects different LFO shapes, 4 is the LFO delay, 5 is the voice mode, 6 is the voice mode adjustment, 7 is the sweep curve, 8 is the pitch, 9 is the note length, 10 is the track length, 11 is the transpose, 12 is the random step uh, amount, 13 is the effects type, 14 is the reverb type, 15 switches random on and off, and 16 switches stutter on and off. So the keys across the bottom, 1 takes us into the sample overlay mode, 2 is the settings, 3 is copy, 4 is paste, 5 is auto step, 6 is the BPM selection between pattern and global, 7 accesses the metronome, 8 accesses the pre-count, 9 accesses the uh, clock menu, 10 is the MIDI channel menu, 11 is the uh, MIDI settings menu, 12 is the data menu, 13 is system, uh, 14 is the line in menu, 15 changes the gain by the headphones and 16 mutes the speaker. So as soon as we hit function and sample we're in the sample select mode for the overlay. So buttons 3 to 6 select banks 1 to 4 respectively. And then if we double tap one of them, that puts us into a mode where we can pick banks 5 to 8. Uh, the rubber buttons 8 and 9 select our octaves. 10 exits back to pattern editing. 11 takes us into the selected sample for editing. 14 imports a bank. 15 exports a bank. And then 16 renames the bank. Once we've selected a bank, we can use the step keys below to choose a sound within that. And then once we've done that, we can press uh, rubber button 11 to take us into editing mode. Once we're in editing mode, button 7 initializes our sound. 8 is octave down, 9 is octave up. 10 cancels back to the sample select area. 11 asks us if we want to save, and then we press it again to save. Button 12 is uh, the selection between 24 and 12 kHz, but you can only change this once we've already pressed button 13, which is sampling. So you press button 13 and then you can turn on and off the 24 kilohertz mode. Button 14 allows us to copy another sound in. 15 can export the sound and 16 renames the sound. So also once we're in editing mode, we can use the knobs. So the top row, 1 is the start, 2 is the end, 3 is pitch, 4 is the level. Uh, a lot of these we can use the value knob to make fine adjustments. Below that, 1 is attack, 2 is release. 3 is the auto record level, 4 is the start of the loop, 5 is the end of the loop, 6 is loop on and off, 7 is reverse, 8 is velocity, 9 is the line in level, 10 has no function, and then 11 is volume. And then using the um, step keys we can set that fade with when looping is off. And that's it.